just go ahead and stand and let's worship together. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you fall.
Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised.
God, we come before you today. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship your name. Father, we thank you that you are the God who did miracles back then, miracles today. Father God, I pray that you would help us to remember your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, you are Yahweh. You are the God who sees us. And Lord, we ask you right now to help us in this service to know you more, to fall deeper in love with you as we learn your truths. We love you and praise you in your son's name. Amen and amen. Why don't you take a moment and say hello to someone next to you? all today. If we haven't met yet, my name is Valerie McCord, and I am the administrative pastor here at our Lost Creek campus, and we're so happy to have you here tonight. If you're new, if this is your first time visiting, or if we haven't had the opportunity to meet, we'd love to see you at our welcome area. There, we want to take a moment to introduce ourselves, to let you know a couple ways you can get connected here at the church, and to give you a gift to take home. Pastor Steve will be over at the welcome area once he's done preaching today. So if you're new, or if we haven't met yet, we'd love to see you there. As always, we encourage you to download and utilize our Horizon Church app. There you'll find all the in-service tools you'll need, like sermon notes, connection cards, and a link to give. The only reason we're able to do any of the amazing things here at Horizons is because of your financial generosity. So we thank you for that. And we also want to let you know that there is going to be an Easter offering. So if that is something that you want to do, be sure to earmark that with any of those methods, or when you drop your gift off, you can mark that on the envelope. We also want to invite you to our 25th anniversary on May 22nd at 11 a.m. I am very excited about this because it's going to be like none of our other services. We're all coming together, all the campuses, in one place at Clarksburg Amphitheater. It's gonna be a special day, so you might wanna take a picture of that screen with the information or one of the banners out there. Mark it on your calendar so you can attend. It's gonna be great. We will also be having baptisms this month, April 23rd and 24th. And if that is a step you want to take in your relationship with Jesus, we encourage you to go to our Horizons website, which is horizonchurch.net, um, and take our class so that you can be baptized. And the best moment in our Easter calendar is coming up, and our Christian calendar, I should say, and that is Easter. So we want to let you know we are going to be having the same um, services at the same times, but we will be adding an additional service on Friday at 630. They're all going to be the same, same messages, same worship, um, but just a different time for your convenience. And finally, to my left and your right is our prayer room. Someone's in there praying for us right now. So if at any point during the service you would like prayer, please feel free to utilize that room. And if you turn to the screens, we have some video announcements for you. everyone, my name is Valerie McCord, and I am the administrative pastor here at Horizons. I wanted to invite youth ages 12 to 18 to our Easter celebration. Whether you come every week or if you've never come at all, we encourage you to join us on April 20th from 6.30 to 8.30 in our youth building. We're going to have a message, worship, snacks, and I hear there's a rumor we may have an Easter egg hunt. 
We want to take time to celebrate the hope we have in Jesus with all of you. So we encourage you to bring a friend and we can't wait to see you there. That heart that gets stirred in you by certain poems and music and movies and places in nature and the things you love in the world, the things that make you come alive. God gave you that heart for a reason. One of my friends described it as, I feel behind in everything. I feel behind in my finances, behind in my marriage. I feel behind in my yard work, right? It's just an incessant feel of being behind. There's never enough time. You see, as we've been talking about this weekend, those are all symptoms. They're all symptoms. If we could get to the core of this reality, we would find the condition of fatherlessness. Every day, every one of us is seeking the answer to that question. Do I have what it takes? As a man, and as we go back in our stories, many years before, as a boy. And because life just kind of beats the crap out of us, the answer is mostly no. Do you know that the scripture actually teaches that your heart is good? Oh, I know Jeremiah 17, 9 has been drilled into most of us, right? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yep. That's the Old Testament. Yep. That's true before the coming of Christ and before the salvation that he offers. But even in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 36, 26, God offers the solution to the human dilemma, and it is not discipline. The solution is a new heart. about to listen to a message taught from God's Word. This is one of the most important parts of our gathering. Therefore, we ask you to silence your cell phone, not engage in conversation, and not allow your child to cause a distraction. If your little one does create a distraction, we kindly ask you to respect those around you by taking your child to our clean, safe nursery, using our family viewing area in the cafe, or one of our cry rooms located behind you, where you can see and hear everything and your child will appreciate the extra freedom. Well, I hope you are uh, looking forward to Easter. And this, is, this week we're going to wrap up Isaiah 53, um, which is kind of the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. We've been looking at it for two weeks. This is the third message on Isaiah 53, and then we'll be on into Easter. And this one is called The Unseen Hand. <clears throat> Now, Mitch grew up in a Jewish home. His parents were Orthodox Jews, but they weren't particularly religious. Therefore, most of what Mitch knew about the Torah, that is the Old Testament, he had learned at the Jewish school that he attended as a child and then in the synagogue that he was part of in New York City. Now, when Mitch graduated from high school, he entered, he entered into college and, but he, it, was, it was the 1960s when he went to college. And uh, so he broke his mother's heart and he dropped out of college. And he, uh, he moved to California where the hippie movement was in full bloom and peace, love, and rock and roll became Mitch's new religion. But while Mitch was in California, two of his closest friends who were also Jewish became believers in Jesus and they shared their faith with Mitch. Now, like Mitch, his friends had learned in, in their uh, yeshiva school and in, and in uh, their synagogue that God had promised to send the Messiah to his people. But like Mitch, they had grown up believing that they were still waiting for God's Messiah to appear. But then one day, Mitch's friends came across Isaiah 53. They'd never read the passage before because their rabbis actually skipped that chapter in their public readings of the Torah. But when they read Isaiah 53 for themselves, Mitch's friends were stunned, absolutely stunned. Because Isaiah 53 predicted that, that the coming Messiah would suffer for the sins of his people, and yet he'd be rejected by them when he did. 
And when Mitch, Mitch's friends overlaid the predictions of Isaiah 53 upon the life and death of Jesus, their conclusions shocked them. Because a, a portrait of their Messiah had been painted by God and hung in the art gallery of the, of the Old Testament scriptures so they could recognize him when he came. And yet, Mitch and his friends had never seen that portrait. It had been hidden from them by their teachers in school and by their rabbis in the synagogue because they feared. They feared that if they, if they looked at the person described in Isaiah 53 with an unbiased mind, that they would surely conclude that it was none other than Jesus of Nazareth. And they couldn't have that. And so their teachers and their rabbis hid the passage from them, avoided ever reading it to them. But Mitch and his friends found Isaiah 53, and when they read it, they couldn't deny that the person that was, that was pictured in that passage had to be Jesus. And so they fell to their knees, and they repented, and they confessed that Jesus was their Messiah, their Christ, their Christos, their Savior. And then they read Isaiah 53 to Mitch, and he came to the same conclusion that they did, that their Messiah had come. He had suffered for their, had suffered for their sins, just as God promised he would do, and that his name was Jesus of Nazareth. Now, a year later, Mitch went home to New York City to see his mom and his dad and to enroll in Bible college. Now, he didn't know how he was going to tell his parents that he had become a follower of Yeshua, of Jesus, but he knew he had to. His parents were overjoyed to see him, and uh, his mom immediately wanted to know if Mitch was going to go back to college. And she was uh, beaming with joy when Mitch said yes, but then her uh, joy turned to concern when he told her that he wasn't going back to, to the university. He was going to go to a Bible college. And then his mom's concern turned to horror when she asked Mitch, well, what's a Bible college? And uh, then discovered that her son had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. That's when Mitch's visit turned into a full-scale meltdown drama. His mom blamed his father for, being, for not being religious enough. His father blamed the mother for being too religious. They both blamed Mitch's grandparents for being too old-fashioned, too orthodox. But in the end, Mitch's parents banished him from their home and tried to dictate who he could and could not speak to in the family about his faith in Jesus. But before Mitch honored his parents' request and left their home, he asked his mom, if he, could, if he could tell her, show her, why he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And she said, yes, as long as you don't use the New Testament. Mitch agreed. And so they sat down, and Mitch began to read Isaiah 53 to his mother from an English translation of the Torah of the Old Testament. He fully expected that when his mom saw the God's portrait of the suffering Messiah in Isaiah 53, that she'd come to the same conclusion that he had, that the person in that portrait was obviously Jesus. But by the time Mitch finished reading the first eight verses, his mother was dozing off to sleep. And so he woke her back up and asked if he could continue to read the chapter. She agreed. And so he finished reading Isaiah 53, and when he was done, he asked his mom, so what do you think? And his mom said, I told you not to read the New Testament to me. Mom, Mitch replied, that's our Bible. Isaiah is a Jewish prophet in the Torah. I don't care, she answered. Don't ever bring this up to me again. Now, the parallels between the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the death of Jesus were so striking to Mitch's mom that she thought that Mitch was reading the New Testament to her. And, if, and she refused to listen to, even to listen to what the, her own Bible said about the Messiah. And as far as we know, Mitch's mom never took those blinders off and let Isaiah 53 speak for itself. Because she was just too biased. She, had, she was so biased against Jesus that she couldn't even admit that Isaiah 53 was in 
her Jewish Bible. Her son, on the other hand, graduated from Bible college, went on and went on to Fuller Seminary and became Dr. Mitch Glasser. Mitch dedicated his life to helping his Jewish brothers and sisters take those blinders off and to discover that their Messiah had come and that his name was Jesus. And in 1997, Mitch became the president of the largest Jewish outreach ministry in the world, the Chosen People Ministries. And 52 years after Mitch first saw Jesus of Nazareth in Isaiah 53, he's still reading that chapter to Jewish brothers and sisters and then asking, so what do you think? Now, I'd like to tell you that reading the Bible with blinders on is just a Jewish problem. I'd like to tell you that you and I don't struggle with that kind of bias, but that would be a lie. Because looking at Jesus with a, through a jaundiced eye is not a Jewish problem or a Gentile problem. It's a human problem. We all want to create Jesus in our own image, in our own likeness, so that uh, we can be comfortable in our flawed lives and not have to change. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was so enthralled with the, uh, the scientific enlightenment of his, of his day that he was embarrassed by the miracles of Jesus because he insisted that miracles were just scientifically impossible. But Thomas Jefferson didn't discard the Bible and throw away Jesus. No, he just created, he just created a Jesus that was more to his liking. He had a new Bible that he made of his very, own, his very own version of the Bible, and he retained all the moral teachings of Jesus. But he removed all the passages in the Bible that talked about Jesus doing miracles. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that just seems like a pretty big bias to me. When I, when I was living in Indianapolis, there was a church there that liked what Jesus said about loving other people and forgiving others, those who had offended you. And they really liked what Jesus uh, said about uh, condemning those who were judgmental. But they didn't like what Jesus said about marriage being between a man and a woman. And they became greatly offended when they read those passages and you talk to them about those passages in the Bible that called same-sex relationships, that sexual relationship, a sin. But they didn't, dis they didn't throw away Jesus. They didn't discard Jesus. They just created Jesus and form of Jesus that fit their bias. They kept those parts of Jesus that they liked, and they denied those parts of Jesus that offended them. And they taught that the gay lifestyle was okay because they said, well, isn't it obvious Jesus and the 12 disciples were just openly gay? Now, I don't know about you, but that's always seemed like a pretty big bias to me. But if the truth is told, all of us struggle with letting Jesus be Jesus on some level. All of us want to keep the parts of Jesus that we like and ignore the parts of him that don't fit the vision how we think things ought to be. Now, some folks want a Jesus who never lets them suffer or get sick. Others want a Jesus who will make them rich if they just have enough faith. Some want Jesus to be a liberal Democrat Others want him to be a, a woke social justice warrior. And still others want, uh, want Jesus to be a straight ticket Republican. But Jesus didn't come into this world to be shoehorned into our preconceived ideas. He didn't come to be, to be forced into these, to who we think he ought to be and what we think he ought to do. No, he came into this world to show us who he is. He came into this world to do his father's will, he came into this world to establish his kingdom and to invite us into it so that we, so that we could join him in his work, what he came to do, not what we think he ought to do. Now today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to look at a truth about Jesus, and in particular a truth about his death uh, that people have chafed at for 2,700 years. They chafed at this truth when Isaiah wrote about it 700 years before Jesus ever was born in Bethlehem. They chafed about it when Jesus lived this truth out and died on a cross in Jerusalem. And people are still chafing about it today, 2,000 years later. So what is it about Jesus and about his death that gets stuck in the craw of so many people? 
Well, the problem that we struggle with is not, it's not the fact that Jesus died on a cross. I mean, people that don't even believe in Jesus will wear a cross around their neck. No, our problem, the problem we struggle with is about why. Why Jesus hung on a cross. That's the part that our culture struggles to understand. It may be what you're struggling with. Because our problems revolve around how God looks at our sin and the drastic measures that Jesus had to take to pay for our sins when he died on the cross. Because, gosh, if we're honest, I mean, if we're just drop dead honest, most of us don't really think that our sins are that big of a deal. And if they're not that big of a deal to us, we're not sure why they should be such a big deal to God. I mean, he's God, isn't he? Why can't he just kind of wave his, wave his hand, give us a hall pass, and just say, for, you're forgiven? Why can't he just do that? You see, we have a bias. We have a bias when it comes to sin because we want, Jesus, we want God to adopt how we see sin and how we look at it. We, we want God to adopt our bias so we can just keep doing what we're doing and not have to change. We really, really, really don't want to, we don't want to be sinners in the hands of an angry God. We want to be sinners in the hands of an indifferent God who winks at sin like we do. But God doesn't wink at sin. He does not wink at sin. When we break family laws, there's family consequences. When we break civil laws, there are civil consequences. And when we break God's eternal laws, you know what happens. There is eternal consequences. Because sin always exacts a debt. When we sin, it creates a debt. That's why we pray. Well, that's why Jesus said, when you pray, say, pray and ask God to forgive your what? Debts. To forgive your debts as you forgive your debtors. Forgive what you owe like you forgive others. Because every sin incurs a debt. Every time we break one of God's eternal laws, we incur an eternal debt that must be paid. It can't be waived off. It's a debt that has to be satisfied. God calls that debt the wages of sin. It's what we have justly earned for our choices to defy him and sin. But here's the deal. Justice only allows your sin debt to be paid in one of two ways. It can be paid by you. Yes, you can pay it yourself in a place called hell. Or it can be paid for you by Jesus. But it must be paid. God can't just wave the debt off. If he did, he'd be winking at your sin and he would no longer be a just God. But God is a just God and therefore he requires that our sin debt be paid down to the penny. And so for God to wipe our slate clean and forgive us, he has to find a way that he can be just and still justify us, make us righteous, forgive us when we come to him by faith. Even when you forgive someone uh, who sinned against you, you're not, you're not erasing the debt that they owe God. You're simply admitting that you're not qualified to be God's debt collector you're, you're, you're placing that person in the, in the, that wronged you in the hands of a just and righteous God who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Not you, I will repay, says the Lord, because God is the only one who can and must hold men and women eternally accountable for their sin choices. Now, as I mentioned, option number one is <clears throat> you can pay your eternal, your eternal sin debt yourself, in a terrible place that God calls hell. But option number two is, <clears throat> Jesus can pay your sin debt for you by suffering and dying for you on a cross. Dying in your place. Paying your penalty for you. But my question is, how did, how did Jesus actually pull that off? I mean... How did his death on a Roman cross end up paying off our eternal sin debt? How did that actually work? 
And that's the question that Isaiah is answering in the last three verses of Isaiah 53. And the answer that he gives begins with a pretty startling revelation. Because in Isaiah 53, we're told that there was actually a fourth person. There was a fourth person involved with the crucifixion of Jesus. And the unseen hand of that fourth person turned the Roman cross that Jesus was placed upon into God's altar. So he could be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that brings us to our first life principle. Here it is. The father, hijacks, the father hijacked the cross. He hijacked the cross and he turned it into an altar. That's what he did. The father hijacked the Roman cross, turned it into an altar. And why did he do that? So Jesus could pay our sin debt and then be our Savior. You know, when we read about the crucifixion in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those four books that open up the New Testament... Three main characters jump off the page at us. I mean, there's Jesus, obviously Jesus. There's the Jewish, the Jews who hate Jesus. And there's the Romans who crucified him. Those three jump off the page at us. But when you read those accounts a little closer, you'll discover there's actually a fourth person, a fourth person involved with Christ's crucifixion. We get a glimpse of him when Jesus says, uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And to finish his work. Jesus didn't come to do what he wanted to do. He didn't come to do what you and I want him to do. He says, I came, I came to this earth to do the will of the one who sent me. And to finish the work that he sent me here to do. And an important part of the work that this person sent him here to do was to die on a cross in the place of sinful men and women so he could save them. Now, one of the reasons we know that's true is because the night before Jesus was crucified, while he was praying in the Garden of Eden, you remember, he prayed. And who was he praying to? His father. And he said, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, but not as I will, but as you will. You see, Jesus is praying. When he's, while he's praying, he's talking to the fourth person who's involved with the crucifixion, and he's talking to God the Father. And if he drinks this cup, he will do it because it is the will of that fourth person, of the Father. So when Jesus asks the Father to take this cup from him, what, what is he talking about? What is the cup that he's talking about? He's talking about the cup of, of his suffering, the suffering he's got to endure in order to pay for the sins of you and me. He's talking about going to the cross and finishing the work that the Father sent him to do. That's the cup. You see, God the Father was involved in the crucifixion too because it was God the Father who turned the evil intentions of men upside down and he, so that the wicked plans of, of these people would it inadvertently, unexpectedly, surprisingly, plot twist wise, accomplish the perfect plan of God? Peter said, this, said it like this when he addressed his Jewish brothers and sisters in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. He says, This man, talking about Jesus, was handed over to you by, by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And yet, he says, and you, with the help of wicked men, he says, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. He puts those two things side by side because there was a fourth person involved with the cross. The Jewish elites who hated Jesus hauled him before a kangaroo court. They found him guilty of trumped up charges and they pressured the Romans into doing their dirty work and crucifying the Lord of glory on one of their crosses. But an unseen hand the unseen hand of God the Father hijacked this carefully laid plan and he turned Rome's cross into an altar so Jesus could offer himself upon that altar and become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that, my friend, is a plot twist. And that's a plot twist that is neither his Jewish enemies nor his Roman executioners saw coming. They completely missed it. But Isaiah saw that plot twist Isaiah saw the plot twist 700 years before it happened, and he described it like this. He says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, he says, but the Lord, now that's when you see in your Bible, 
Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, all capitals. When you see that in your English translation, it's telling you that that word Lord is going back to the Hebrew word or Hebrew name Yahweh. But Yahweh, the Lord, and here it's God the Father. But the Lord, Yahweh, God the Father, was pleased to crush him, the suffering servant, Jesus, and put him, Jesus, to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. You see, the, the father hijacked the crucifixion with all of its evil intentions, and he turned that Roman cross into his altar so Jesus could offer himself upon it. And he says he offered himself as a guilt offering for your sins and for mine. Now, the guilt offering was unique because like the sin offering, like the sin offering, it required that a lamb die in the place of the sinner. But the guilt offering also required something unique. It required that the sinner pay restitution to the person that they had wronged. Now, it wouldn't matter, it didn't matter if I had wronged that person inadvertently or I'd, I'd wronged them intentionally, the guilt offering still required me to pay restitution to them beyond the sacrifice so I could be reconciled to the person that I had wronged. But the guilt offering didn't require me to pay just 100% of what I owed the person that I had wronged. It actually required me to pay 120%, an extra 20, an extra 20% of what I owed them. The first 100% settled the debt the additional 20% was paid to the offended party as an amends for having wronged them to begin with. It was a way to say, I really am sorry. You see, the guilt offering went the extra mile to make sure that the relational debt that separated the offender from the offended was fully satisfied so that reconciliation could happen. So think about what that means. When it says that Jesus was our guilt offering. I mean, that when Jesus died on the cross for you and me, he not only paid 100% of the wages of our sin, <clears throat> he also paid that extra 20% to make an amends to the Father on our behalf for having sinned against him to begin with. So when Jesus finished his work on the cross and cried out with a loud voice, it's finished. He's not just announcing that he's paid off 100% of what we owe the Father. He's also announcing that he's gone the extra mile. He's made that additional payment, that additional 20% to ensure that you and I could be reconciled to our Father, whom we offended by our choices. And because Jesus did all these things, because he did all that and finished the work that his Father sent him to do, his Father rewarded him. Book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says that it tells, said that Jesus endured the cross and he, and he absorbed the shame of the cross. And why did he do it? He says he did it <clears throat> for the joy that was set before him. That is, he looked beyond the crucifixion and he saw the rewards that were going to be coming to him and the benefits that were going to be coming to us. And he said, that's worth it. And he went to the cross and he endured its suffering and absorbed its shame. <clears throat> now, Isaiah 53.10 tells us about three of those joys that Jesus is currently experiencing because he offered himself on the cross as a, as a, as a guilt offering for you and me. For example, it says that he will be given an offspring. He'll be given a family. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, what do you become? As many as receive him will become the children of God, to all those who believe on his name. You become his offspring. Isaiah tells us that uh, his days will be prolonged. The Messiah died. Jesus died on that cross. How's his day going to be prolonged? Obvious answer, he's going to raise from the dead. But he's not just going to raise from the dead. He's going to raise from the dead never to die again. You realize Every person that died before Jesus' resurrection had to go back to the grave. Realize that? <clears throat> I mean, Jesus resurrected the widow of Zarephath, or the, uh, 
the the um, the 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 son of a Seraphonician woman. He he he, uh, he resurrected him. He resurrected the daughter of a of a centurion. He resurrected his own his own friend Lazarus from the grave. But all of those people that he raised during his public ministry had to die again. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Because 1 Corinthians 15, 23 tells us that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection unto life. That is, he is the first one to be resurrected, never to die again. His days will be prolonged. And then Jesus has received this third reward. Um, Isaiah says, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. We see that playing out before our very eyes because Jesus said, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It will prosper in my hand. Jesus is orchestrating the affairs of men so that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And one day Jesus will return. And when he does, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand because God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven just as we've been praying for centuries. But for all that to happen, Jesus had to pay for our sins, and he had to make restitution to the Father for our offenses. The Father had to turn the cross into an altar. Jesus had to offer himself upon it as the Lamb of God. And then the Father had to punish Jesus for your sins and mine so that he could be just when he declares that the wages of our sins have been paid in full, right down to the penny. But paying our sin debt required Jesus to suffer more than just physically on the cross. It even required that he, and that, uh, he suffer, they endure more than the relational suffering that he experienced when he was separated from his father and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because to pay the wages of our sin, Jesus is not just his body, but his soul had to suffer also. His soul had to endure the wrath of God against our sin that we would have faced in hell. Romans chapter 2 and verse 5 tells it like this. He warns us. He says, because of your stubbornness and the unrepentance and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath. There's a harsh word. That's a word we don't like. Because of our stubbornness and our unrepentant heart, our unwillingness to repent, he says, you're actually storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Because you see, what we earn for sinning isn't just physical death. It isn't just spiritual death. We've also earned eternal death where we come face to face with a reckoning, face to face with the wrath of God against our choices, against our defiance of him. And so if Jesus is going to free us from the wages of our sin, he has to experience all three kinds of those deaths. If he's going to pay the wages of our sin and the wages of sin is death, he has to die physically. His body and his soul have to separate. He gave up his spirit and he died, we're told. His, he has to die spiritually. He has to be separated from his father by our sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he also has to die eternally. He has to endure on the cross what we would have experienced in hell if we faced the wrath of God for our sins. And that brings us to this second life principle. Jesus gave the father a way to be just. He gave him a way to be just when he justifies sinners like us. And how did he do it? He did it by draining the cup of God's wrath against our sin. That's how he did it. He drank the cup. He drained it to its dregs so that we wouldn't have to drink it. Now, when I was growing up <clears throat> as a kid, I went to a lot of Easter services, a lot of sunrise services, a lot of Palm Sunday services, by the way. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, and I, when I listened to those uh, messages, they'd spell out the terrible sufferings that Jesus endured on the cross. 
But it was never clear to me as a kid how Christ's physical agonies alone could pay for my sin, you know, no matter how terrible it was. Lots of people died in those terrible deaths on the cross. How was his different? And then one day I read Isaiah 53, 11, which begins with these words. As the result of the anguish of his soul, that is the soul of Jesus, not just his body, but the anguish of his soul. He, that is God the Father, will see it, the anguish of Christ's soul, and he'll be satisfied. The Father will be satisfied. When I read that passage, the light suddenly clicked on in my head, and I, and I understood that Jesus didn't just suffer physically for me. He did, because he had to die physically. But he also endured my eternal death. I mean, his soul was crushed as the weight of my sin was placed upon him, and he drank the cup of God's wrath against my sin that I had stored up by my choices. Because if he didn't drink that cup down to his dregs, I would have to drink it myself in this terrible place called hell. The last two verses of Isaiah 53 read, uh, read like this in the New American Standard Bible. It says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, that is Jesus' soul, he, the Lord, Yahweh, the Father, will see it, the anguish of his soul, and he'll be satisfied and as a result of that, by his knowledge, the righteous one, the, my servant, will justify many as he will bear their iniquities. Then he says, therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. And he will divide his booty with the strong. And why are you going to do that, Lord? Because he poured himself out to death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He identified with them. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for those transgressors. Now, we normally use the, New, America, the New, Inter New International Version of the Bible in our preaching services because it's just a great translation. But at times, we use other good translations because sometimes they're just easier to understand. And this is one of those times. That's why I read this section of Isaiah from the New American Standard Bible. It just it makes what Isaiah is saying really, really clear. And so if you're looking for a good translation to read alongside of your NIV, I would encourage you. Buy a New American Standard Bible. It's a great translation. It'll help you and uh, give you another good translation to set side by side and read. It's called the NASB. But twice in this passage, we are told that Jesus bore our sins. Bore our sins, we are told. Twice. But what? But, but to do that, to bear our sins, Jesus had to be numbered with the transgressors. We're the transgressors. He had to be identified with us. He had to be numbered with us. He had to identify with people like you and me so he could take our sins upon him. Or as Peter would say it, so he could bear our sins in his body on the tree. But here's what I really, really want you to get. I, this is what I don't want you to miss. When Jesus bore our sins, he also took upon himself the eternal punishment that was due our sins. That is, when he bore our sins, he bore our hell. He paid for our sins so we wouldn't have to. He went through what we would go through in facing the wrath of God for our sins. Now, hell is a terrible place. It is a terrible place. It's a place where grace is absent. It's a place where absolute justice is meted out. It's a place where we come face to face with the wrath of God that we've been storing up for our sinful choices. It's not a good place. It's a terrible place. So in order for Jesus to bear our sins, he must also suffer. Not just physically, but his soul has to suffer also. He will see the anguish of his soul and be satisfied. He must drain the cup of God's wrath against your sin and mine, and he must do it until the Father is satisfied that the wages of sin have been paid down to the last penny. And so when Jesus hung upon the cross and the sins of the world were placed upon him, upon him the Father began to pour out your hell and mine upon his soul. But the Father could only punish Jesus for our sins because Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. That is, he took humanity 
upon himself. He became 100% man. To be able to bear man's, to be able to bear human sin, you have to be human. A lamb can't do it. Only a human can do it. But Jesus wasn't just 100% man. He was also 100% God. Because he has to be able to drain the cup of God's wrath on the cross. And he does in three hours. Because to pay an infinite debt, guess what? You have to be infinite. You have to be God. Otherwise, you spend eternity paying off the interest. And because Jesus wasn't dragged to the altar like an unwilling sheep in the Old Testament, but willingly laid down his life for you and me, and he died in our place physically, spiritually, and eternally in order to pay our sin, and because he did that of his own free will, no one dragged him. The Father didn't put an arm, arm twist him and say, you're going to do it whether you want to or, or not. Because he went there willingly, not only was his payment complete, but it was also just. There is no justice in forcing someone else to die for my sins. But if he does it willingly, that's grace. And that's justice. Married in a sacrifice. And that's what Jesus did. And when Jesus drained the cup of God's wrath and drank down its bitter dregs, he pulled himself up on his spikes and he said with a loud voice, it is finished. It's paid in full. The wages of your sins and mine paid down to the penny. Or as the Apostle John put it in 1 John 2, 2, Jesus became the propitiation, the satisfactory payment for our sins. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Even for people who say, who raise their fist and say, I don't believe any of that. He died for them too. Say, how do you know? Well, because, well, here he says it. But also, he, we're told in 2 Peter 2.1 that Jesus died even for false teachers. In 2 Peter 2.1, he, he says these false teachers who were rejecting Jesus and they were teaching destructive heresies, Peter says that these men were denying the Lord who bought them. Who bought them? Who paid their sin penalty? Their sin debt. Jesus made a satisfactory payment for sin for all men and all women. He even paid for the sins of these unrepentant false teachers who turned their back upon his sacrifice and went to their graves, denying him. He said he paid for their sins too. And now, <clears throat> now because Jesus made that satisfactory payment for our sins... He can offer every man, every woman, every child a free gift. He can justify us. He can declare us forgiven. He can make us right with God if we'll embrace Jesus and accept his free gift, his, sac his, his free payment in our place, his death. There's no gimmick. There's no small print. It's absolutely free because he prepaid it. And because Jesus humbled himself as a servant of the Lord and suffered our hell for us, Isaiah says, he was given, he'll be given, he's given a place with the great. And he's going to share his booty with the strong. Do you know where Jesus is right now? You know where he is? He's been given a place with the great. He is seated at the right hand of his father. And you know what he's doing right now? He's sharing the booty of his victory with you and me. And it starts with salvation. It starts with washing away our sins and giving us eternal life. Now, I don't, know about, um, I don't know about you, but if you're like me, companies are constantly, gosh, constantly offering me uh, one of their credit cards. Anybody got that problem? Yeah. A steady stream of those credit cards appear in my mailbox. Every time I go to Penny's or to Walgreens, they say, Mr. Felder, if you uh, get one of our credit cards, we'll take 10% off of your purchase today. But I have a bias about credit cards. It seems to me that all that uh, credit cards, uh, all of them seem to have high interest rates and there's lots of fine print, you know, when it comes to credit cards. I have, uh, I have a fixed rate card that I pay off every month so I don't have to pay the 8% that comes with the card. But when a card comes in the mail, I throw it away. And when a clerk offers me a card across the checkout counter, I say, no, thank you. I tell him I'm plastic aversive. 
So the other day when Jody opened up a, a piece of mail and there was a MasterCard in one of those envelopes that said, and she turned to me and she said, oh, it's one of those cards. She said, you want me to just cut it up and throw it away? And I said, yeah, throw it away. But as she turned to walk to go get the scissors, I don't know, something just click, click, click in my head. I said, wait a minute, what does that paper say about that card? And she looked at it and she said, well, it says it's a prepaid MasterCard. It's probably some scam. And I said, well, you're probably right. But just, let me just take a look at it. So she gave it over, came and handed it to me with a piece of paper. And I picked it up <clears throat> and I began to look at it and I discovered it wasn't a credit card at all. It was a prepaid debit card. You can't even add anything to it. They can't add something to it. I can't add something to it. It's just got money on it. Come from a Kia. We have a Kia Soul. And uh, the suffering my soul has brought me a Kia gift card. You know. <clears throat> but the card was there. And I looked at it and I said, well, that's a debit card. It says you can't, they can't add something to it. And I can't add something to it. But in order to get the money off of it, I had to activate the card. I said, well, it looks like it could work. And so I activated the card. And wouldn't you know it? 60 bucks, free of charge. Not a credit card, a debit card. Worth $60, free money. But I almost threw it away. Because I was so biased against credit cards, I almost threw away a free gift. You know, that may be, that may be where you are today. Because Jesus has prepaid your sin debt. And he's offering you a free gift. You don't have to do anything, just accept it. It's yours for the asking, but you have to activate the cord. You have to take a step of faith. You have to ask for it in a prayer that might sound something like this. Jesus, I believe you paid for my sins when you suffered on the cross. And I'm asking you to apply that payment to my life so I can be forgiven and I can have a relationship with you. I'm not asking because I deserve it. I certainly don't. I'm asking because I believe you'll keep your word. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to be part of, my, of your family. Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. I was so biased against anything that looked like a credit card, I almost threw away a $60 gift. If I'd have dropped that, in the, that card in the trash, the offer would have been real, the money would have been good, but I'd have never benefited from it. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let your bias against God being a just God blind you to the free gift that he's offering to you. It's real. It's available. You just have to put your faith in Jesus and ask for it. So why don't you do that? Why don't you do that today? The gift is purchased. It's paid for. You just have to claim it. So why don't you claim it? Why don't you ask for it? Why don't you say, yes, Jesus, I want it. He'll give it to you. It's paid for. It's free. You can have it. You just got to ask. Don't leave here today without doing it. You need it. I need it. Because you don't want to face the consequences of your sin. Jesus already did it. If I haven't met you, I'm going to be over here. Love to get to know you, give you a gift. Before you leave, accept the gift. God bless you. You have a great week.